Coming up on One Detroit, Michigan voters went to the polls. Analysis of the primary results and Vice President Kamala Harris chooses a running mate in the race for president. Plus, the CEO of Forgotten Harvest explains how the nonprofit is helping families keep food on the table this summer. Also ahead, it's time for Detroit's collard green cook-off. We'll talk with last year's champion about his winning recipe. And we'll share some of the unique events taking place in Metro Detroit this weekend and beyond. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at dtefoundation.com. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Just ahead on One Detroit, the new CEO of Forgotten Harvest talks about a rising demand for his organization's services. Plus, we'll meet the defending champion of Detroit's colored green cook-off and learn what makes his dish unique. And David Wagner from 90.9 WRCJ has a list of Metro Detroit events to enjoy this weekend and beyond. But first up, Michigan is looking ahead to the November election now that the primary is over. And Vice President Kamala Harris made the state one of her first presidential campaign stops with her newly named running mate. I joined my fellow One Detroit contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal for a discussion about this week's big political news. Okay, you two. So we are now post-primary <laughs> oh, I think I gotta just ask. We're a little, are we a little status quo? Like we've got this open U.S. Senate seat is is going to be Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, the Democrat, former Congressman Mike Rogers, the Republican. We all sort of knew this was coming. No, Nolan. Yeah, I don't think there was any surprise there. Uh, you know, you had some dropouts in this race uh, on the Republican side that pretty much gave Mike Rogers an easy path to victory. Victory, uh, Justin Amash, the former congressman from West Michigan, who went from re Republican to Independent and then back to the Republican Party to get uh, run in this race, never seemed to take off. Never seemed to have much of a campaign going on. And you know, Hill Harper put up a pretty good fight, given the you know what he was up against. He was just overwhelmed by Slotkin's fundraising, and so. But, you know, he he did respectably in that race. And now we've got uh, what I think is going to be a real Donnybrook of a fall race. Stephen, I mean, we should note this open U.S. Senate seat could really, I mean, change and will have a big influence on what the U.S. Senate looks like come November. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a place where Republicans, of course, hope to pick up, um, you know, a seat that they haven't had um, in a long time. And let's remember, a Republican has not won a Senate race in Michigan since I think it's uh, 1998 um, or before that. Um, 1994. 94, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a reason There's a reason for that. Uh, you know, I don't know that that Mike Rogers um, gets it done, but but I will say that, that uh, you know, he's probably the, the strongest candidate they've nominated in a long time, um, you know, his problem will be, you know, he, he has uh, wrapped his arms pretty enthusiastically around Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, I, I think this fall in Michigan, that could be something of a, of a liability. And then, of course, you know, Alyssa Slotkin is, is just a, a juggernaut in terms of um, campaign organization and fundraising. And, and matching that is going to be, I mean, it's going to be a terribly expensive race. But just keeping up with her is going to be uh, quite a bit for him. Well, there's going to be a lot of poor money poured into this race by both Republican Democrats from the outside. 
Uh, Republicans have, see it as as one of their top two chances to flip a Democratic seat. Uh, uh, the other one being West Virginia, which is also an open seat. So you're going to see a lot of outside spending. This won't be won or lost for lack of money, I, I, I don't think. And yeah, it's all about Trump. But if you look, I mean, Trump's still running pretty strong in Michigan. And if he if he makes his race really close, as close as it was, say, in, in 2016 or even 2020, the Senate candidate has a pretty good chance. I think Rogers uh, might find some coattails there. Or, you know, if it goes the other way, I think uh, he doesn't have uh, a very good chance at all against Slotkin. So so one of the interesting stats out of the, the election is the total number of votes on, mm -hmm. on both sides, right? You've got an enthusiasm gap on the Republican side that I think was really evident yesterday. Uh, the number of votes that Slotkin got was staggering. Um, and, and Mike Rogers is going to have to figure out a way to get people, you know, on his side more enthusiastic about it. Um, I would imagine that there were a lot of uh, independents, perhaps, who who bled over into that Democratic primary um, as well. So, or um, didn't vote. you know, it's it, or didn't vote. It's not all that uncommon for Democrats to outperform Republican uh, uh, participation in primaries. Uh, it's just uh, right. But if they do that in the general in Michigan, they always win. Um, and so that's the that's the challenge he has. Always in the state of Michigan, the sort of get out the vote effort, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, let's look at some of those other congressional uh, races. Again, no huge surprises, but one race, I know the three of us were watching, was Detroit, Shri <laughs> Tanadar, the incumbent, who will remain the incumbent. Uh, Nolan, but Mary Waters gave him a little bit of a run for his money. Well, you know, she was uh, she had the endorsement of the mayor and she was sort of the default candidate of uh, the Detroit Democratic establishment. But, uh, you know, Sri Thanedar has proven now in two elections a lot tougher to, to beat than than folks thought he would be. And uh, I, I don't think Mary Waters was the right candidate to uh, to oust him. But I do think now Detroit's going to have to live with Sri Thanedar as their representative for a while to come. You win that second race and, you know, you almost become unbeatable as a congressperson. Stephen, and here we go and we continue. Um, no black representation in Congress for the city yeah. of Detroit. Yeah, for the first time since uh, 1955, I think it was. Um, when African Americans first were represented by one of their own in, in Congress. So, you know, here we are again. It doesn't look like that's going to change for Black Detroiters anytime soon. Well, we've got just about a minute left. Let's talk about the very, very tippity top of the ballot come <laughs> November. And that is the all encompassing presidential race, uh, vice president and uh, presidential candidate uh, Kamala Harris announced Minnesota Governor Tim Walls as her running mate just this week, and they are just barnstorming up a storm, a bunch <laughs> of different swing states, including the state of Michigan. We only got a minute or so. Uh, Stephen, I want to start with you. Does the Tim Walz nomination mean anything here in the state of Michigan? Uh, I think it does. Uh, he's a Midwesterner. Uh, he is uh, a, a, a hunter and a teacher oh. and all of these things that, uh, you know, no one's laughing, but, you know, these independent voters, these especially independent women are looking for those kind of the qualities in a, in a candidate. I, I don't think I don't think the Democrats could have done any better uh, in terms of who they picked here. Minnesota is the best performing Midwest state. Uh, it invests in education and and uh, and other things, but also attracts all kinds of businesses. Um, uh, it spends more on education than it does on prisons, not, which we don't can't figure out how to do here uh, in Michigan. I, I, it's a strong pick. It'll it'll be interesting to see how they do. Nolan, last word with you. Yeah, I don't think anybody heard of most people hadn't heard of Tim Walls before the pick. He wasn't among uh, for very long among the top choices. He does nothing to balance the ticket. He's also a far left uh, progressive, has governed that way 
I don't think that's going to have a great deal of appeal, appeal for independence of either, either sex. So here we go again. We've got a Republican ticket that's wholly from the far right, right a Democratic ticket wholly from the far left, and the middle is completely uncovered. And just a little more than 80 days to go. We're going to keep talking about it here. Thank you both so much, <laughs> you two. Turning now to the high price of food and the impact on families who are trying to make ends meet. According to Feed America, one in five children in southeastern Michigan faces hunger. The need increases during the summer when kids don't get regular meals at school. One Detroit contributor and American Black Journal host Stephen Henderson spoke with the new CEO of Forgotten Harvest, Adrian Lewis, about how the organization is making sure families have access to fresh, nutritious food now and throughout the year. Let's talk about the things that uh, you're confronting uh, as you take over there at, uh, at Forgotten Harvest. Um, uh, we want to talk more specifically about summer and how different that is, but, uh, but give us an overall picture of, of the organization yeah. and the challenges. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, Forgotten Harvest, uh, over the almost 35 years of its existence, has always been about closing that gap on uh, food insecurity and hunger throughout Metro Detroit. That has not changed. Uh, and uh, as we um, begin to now better leverage our new facility, we are truly doing that, Stephen. Uh, and that's really um, fortunate in a sense that, you know, we're able to do it because we're seeing a 30% increase in demand for our services. So being able to do that, it's, it's, it's definitely a plus. But obviously, we want to make sure that we're being very specific and concise on where we're, you know, addressing that need. Yeah, let's talk about that new facility. That's been a long time coming. Uh, yeah. What's the advantage to the organization of having that facility and, and how, how much better that makes the, the services that, uh, that you provide? Absolutely. Um, you know, the facility itself is about 78,000, I'll call it 80,000 square feet. And to be able to not only have the extra capacity to hold uh, food goods, but we're now able to really be creative in how we distribute it, especially from an equitable uh, perspective and making mm -hmm. sure that we're getting things sorted uh, so that we can reach all of our 260 distribution sites uh, in a timely manner. All right, so let's talk about summer. Uh, mm -hmm. and what summer means for hunger in this community and therefore what it means for Forgotten Harvest. Things look a little different than they do other parts of the year. Yeah, um, you know, if we look at the vulnerable populations of our children, uh, as well as our seniors, right? If we look at just those two, and there's probably a, a few others I could easily name, but summer feeding is, has definitely been a focus um, uh, you know, we have at over 10 sites that we're doing summer feeding at, but being able to definitely keep the youth nourished as well as uh, involved during the summer months. Uh, but also for our seniors, we're partnering with, um, you know, Amazon, DoorDash to be able to do deliveries throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our seniors aren't able to get out as you would imagine. So we're identifying those individuals that we can help and assist. Uh, and it's all about choice, right? I mean, mo many of our distributions are a matter of, you know, you, you'll see those already predetermined amounts that we're giving to our, to our neighbors in need. Uh, but we are now working on our, on our client choice market in which uh, we will have the ability to have our, our neighbors to come in and shop just like a grocery store mm -hmm. uh, in which, you know, it's not a new concept, but it is new and exciting for us to be able to roll out into the community. I also wonder what you're seeing in terms of the need uh, in our community and whether it is more acute right now um, because of, you know, some of the things that, that we're dealing with in the general economy. Or, in fact, whether maybe they're not as acute. I mean, uh, we keep hearing stats about the falling numbers of children in poverty because of things like the, the federal tax credit and, and some other measures. But, but I wonder what that looks like from, from you as a provider. 
Yeah, it, it definitely, uh, what we're seeing, it, it definitely aligns uh, with uh, the high inflation of food, right? Mm. It definitely yeah. aligns with that. It yeah. definitely shifted as the tax credits were uh, exhausted, so yeah. to speak. Right. Uh, so that definitely aligned. But you know what was really interesting post-pandemic, as I would say, is that many uh, of our family of, of our of our neighbors in need or neighbors in general were just made more aware of that dignity and respect that we're providing as a service that they're not ashamed to share that they're not a you know they're not a that they're sharing more about the awareness with other neighbors so i believe that also has an uptick in mm -hmm. the use of our services that you know may or may not have been there in the past yeah yeah the second annual Collard Green Cook-Off Championship takes place next week in Detroit. Some of the city's finest cooks will compete for the title of Best Collard Green Chef. The event is produced by Detroit is Different. Bridge Detroit reporter Jenna Brooker and One Detroit's Chris Jordan caught up with last year's winner at the Detroit Food Commons to find out what makes his greens so special. Collard greens are a staple of the black community. Recipes are passed down through generations to family and friends. Sure For Chef Buddha Calhoun, the recipe he refined earned him the title of champion at last year's Collard Green Cook-Off in Detroit. This year, he'll be back to defend that title. My name is Chef Buddha. I'm the owner and uh, director of Buddha Foods. Uh, I'm also known as the vegan gumbo guy across the world because I started off doing vegan gumbo. You know, I grew up on collard greens, and uh, if my grandma was here to taste those, she probably would have gave me that look. Like, what is, how did you do this? Because traditionally, I wasn't taught that. I just learned it from my buddy who learned it from somebody else, and I just took off with it. So what makes the recipe special? Pan frying it. Okay. Traditionally, in most families, people will boil their uh, collard greens. Me, I like to saute them, which is uh, kind of equivalent to how they do over in uh, the East. In Africa, in the Caribbean, they kind of pan fry that stuff with the Cali Lou and all that kind of stuff. Not majority of the cultures, but some cultures would pan fry. Mm -hmm. So I said, if we're going into the contest, everybody's going to cook traditional collard greens. Why don't I saute mine? I had elders in wheelchairs holding my hand the whole time we were serving, because they was like, how did you do this? On August 15th, Calhoun will face off against five other finalists at the Joseph Walker Williams Recreation Center on Rosa Parks Boulevard in Detroit. Yeah, so these collard greens I got from D-Town Farm. Okay, great. I like to put sweet peppers and onions in mine. I don't know, traditionally, I don't think we ever had it like that. If we did, my grandma would cut up fresh tomatoes and fresh onions on the side, and we'd just sprinkle it on top of the greens that were already cooked. But me, I love cooking with sweet peppers because it gives it such a great taste. And I added shallots to this one today just because I had one shallot at home. I said, that's not going to hurt. So why not add that? Today we're gonna to use avocado oil. So roughly what temperature do we want the pan at? Uh, just hot enough to uh, cook down the peppers and onions. With the greens, we don't wanna overcook them. So we're just gonna to toss them around a few times, let it simmer for like, I say about eight minutes at the most. I'm pretty sure a lot of elders will turn their nose up at this, the way I'm pan frying greens, instead of putting them in a pot of boiling water with chicken stock or turkey stock or some type of dead animal product in there to season it. I will tell you what I'm seasoning it with today though chili powder and cumin. Okay. So that is kind of slash like a uh, island flavor that most of the islanders might use. So was that a hot sauce or? That's liquid smoke. Liquid smoke, okay. And I got some chili powder. It doesn't need much because of the potent 
of uh, the cumin and the chili powder. They both have earthy, strong flavors, so. It's also good already. Oh, yes. I have a secret ingredient. I'm not going to tell you guys what it is. What I don't if we want. guess? <laughs> it's definitely vegetable. I don't want to overcook the greens, so I'll cook the peppers and onions first, then add the greens. And I think we're ready to roll. No sodium. I usually do add like a Creole seasoning to it, which will probably bring it out a little bit more, but it's definitely good. What you think? These are so flavorful. And like you were saying, the texture's still there, where there's a little bit of a bite into it. What was the experience like being at the Collard Green Cook-Off, competing against fellow chefs and your neighbors, the community out there? I think it was a little bit too festive for me. I had too much fun. I think I made like 400 friends that day. New 400. friends. Yep, so now when people see me on the street, they're like, it's the collard green guy, right? Before they would call me the vegan gumbo guy. You know, I'm used to that in a way, but with so much people uh, that day, it was overwhelming. So it felt like a royal convention because they was crowning me as like, you, you are really doing it. And especially to see so many elders give me praise, mm -hmm. that was, that was just a beautiful feeling, man. It made me feel real good and it gave me more confidence. So this year I got something a little bit special. It's gonna be similar to the last year's recipe, but I'm gonna add something extra, something that people love, that okay. I realize goes well with greens now. So hopefully I'll come home again with the second trophy. Calhoun is a proponent of a vegan lifestyle and he's adapted some family recipes to lose the meat and focus on locally grown produce. I was raised by my granny. Greens were always boiled. And it was always either smoked turkey or smoked ham hocks in it or something like that, which back then as a kid, it were good. And just about every household or even restaurants that sell greens, it's all cooked the same way. And then so often a lot of people are raised into a certain situation and never really ask why. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wish I could have asked my grandma, like, why do we boil greens? Plus, I'm a big fan of not overcooking produce. Mm -hmm. I'm always want to eat the freshest I can basically from farm to table, not overcooked. I think we're doing things a little bit different than our elders did. And I think it's good. So now we can pass some of these traditions on to our children and our grandchildren. The Collard Green Cook-Off Championship takes place Thursday, August 15th from 4 to 7 p.m. Admission is free. Now let's take a look at some of the other events taking place in Metro Detroit. From barbecue and music in downtown Detroit to a massive yard sale stretching across the state, there's something for families and individuals to enjoy. Here's Dave Wagner of 90.9 WRCJ with today's One Detroit Weekend. Hi, I'm Dave Wagner with WRCJ 90.9, here to tell you about some events to go and check out this weekend and beyond in Metro Detroit. Friday through Sunday is the Ribs R&B Music Festival weekend in Hart Plaza, where, you guessed it, there will be barbecue and R&B on the riverfront. Featured artists are next, Glenn Jones and Adina Howard. Friday through Sunday, the city of Dundee is celebrating their bicentennial pickleball tournaments, historical scavenger hunts, and monster truck rides are just a few of the unique activities that will be happening at that three-day festival. And let me tell you, this weekend has so much more going on, including the Antique Yard Sale Trail along Michigan's Thumb Coast. You can shop over 150 miles of antiques following M29 and M25 through scenic waterfront communities and beaches. On Wednesday, August 14th, families can head to Eastern Market Shed 5 in Detroit for the Be My Neighbor Day, hosted by Detroit PBS. And the Michigan Learning Channel. There will be free resources for families, fun activities, and a dance party led by none other than Daniel Tiger. 
And of course, this time of year brings sunflower blooms and the Bucks Family Farm is having their sunflower festival Friday through August 25th. And there's a ton more happening around Metro Detroit, so stick around for a few more options and have a great weekend. That'll do it for this week's One Detroit. Thank you for watching. Head to the One Detroit website for all of the stories we're working on and follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at dtefoundation.com. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.